Coming up on our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1186 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Russia's destruction of an orbiting satellite raises a major concern over space debris and the Kessler effect. Registration is now open for the 2022 AWRL National Convention at the upcoming Orlando Hamcation. The latest volunteer monitoring program report has been released. We will have all the details. The International Amateur Radio Union Administrative Council addresses a wide-ranging agenda for its upcoming meeting. The most recent AWRL director election results have been announced, and we will tell you who got the most votes. Amateur radio volunteers support communications for the Tour de Lincoln bicycle event in California. And a new prototype antenna that is very small, has big results, and could be integrated into your wallpaper has been demonstrated. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the current chip shortage and how the new infrastructure bill will improve the internet and your access to it. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will talk about defeating the pitfalls of predicting HF propagation. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will have more on incentive licensing as he continues to look at the state of amateur radio in the 50s and 60s. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will answer the question, what tools should I bring on my tower climb? All of that and a lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our disinfected and UV-lit studio here at our headquarters just outside Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the lake effect snow, rain, and fog is raising havoc with my VSWR. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the only leaves left on trees are the brown, crusty ones, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, Russia tested an anti-satellite weapon on November 15th, destroying one of its own old and defunct satellites, Cosmos 1408. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more in this report filed from League Headquarters. Launched in 1982, Cosmos 1408 was some 300 miles above Earth. Its destruction generated a debris field in low Earth orbit that prompted the seven International Space Station crew members, including one Russian cosmonaut, to take cover in their crew capsules for several hours in case they had to abandon the station. NASA Chief Bill Nelson explained that this action was based on a risk assessment by the Debris Office and Ballistics Specialists at Johnson Space Center in Houston, occupants of the Chinese space station are reported to have taken similar action. The incident also generated criticism from many corners as well as a grave discussion on the possible impact of any future such tests by Russia or anyone else. The danger of damage to the ISS or an orbiting satellite aside, tracking a debris field that could include thousands of pieces in order to head off a collision is a concern all its own. AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL, said that Russia's action will pose a threat to all activities in low Earth orbit for years to come placing satellites and human spaceflight missions at risk. As he explained, 
Space is already crowded, but now there are at least 1,500 trackable fragments and possibly hundreds of thousands of smaller yet still threatening pieces of debris in low Earth orbit. Space stations can move out of the way, but most satellites cannot and face greater risk of catastrophe. Gangston said AMSAT is closely monitoring the situation and is hoping for the best. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The incident also has generated criticism from many corners and a grave discussion on the possible impact of any future such tests by Russia or anyone else. Very small debris in space is essentially impossible to track reliably, if at all. The incident also comes at a time when the number of spacecraft in Earth orbit continues to grow. AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL, said that Russia's action will pose a threat to all activities in low Earth orbit for years to come, placing satellites and human spaceflight missions at risk. While space stations have the capability to move out of the way with sufficient notice, most satellites in low Earth orbit, including those designed, built, launched, and operated by AMSAT, do not. As such, they face greater risk of catastrophic destruction or degraded mission functionality if struck by fragments from Russia's destruction of Cosmos 1408. NASA Chief Bill Nelson echoed Secretary of State Antony Blinken in expressing his own outrage at Russia's action. Their actions are reckless and dangerous. The ISS is passing through or near the cloud every 90 minutes, but the need to shelter for only the second and third passes of the event was based on a risk assessment made by the debris office and ballistic specialists at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Johnson explained. FCC Commissioner Nathan Symington condemned the incident as irresponsible and noted that orbital debris fields pose a threat to hopes for the peaceful use of space and make the work of using space complicated and difficult, he said in a statement. For decades to come, they stifle scientific research, inhibit communications, and pose threats to the lives of explorers. And in the here and now, they pose a great threat to existing satellites of all nations deployed for peaceful purposes. No one owns space, Symington said, and no one should intentionally make it more difficult to use. The FCC's orbital debris rules date back to 2004, when the FCC adopted requirements affecting not only Part 97 amateur service rules, but Parts 5, experimental, and Part 25 concerning communication satellites. The FCC has made it clear that orbital debris rules apply to amateur satellites, in general requiring submission of an orbital debris mitigation plan with each license application. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. ARRL and the Orlando Amateur Radio Club will host the 2022 ARRL National Convention and Orlando Hamcation on February 10th through the 13th, 2022 in Orlando, Florida. For more details on the upcoming convention and ham fest, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. The convention theme, Rediscover Radio, highlights radio amateurs' commitment to developing knowledge and skills in radio technology and radio communication. Convention organizer and ARRL Director of Public Relations and Innovation Bob Inderbitson and Q1R says there will be expert presenters community building opportunities and plenty of social time to celebrate being together with friends. And he adds, who doesn't love Florida in February? The convention will kick off on Thursday, February 10th, with a series of morning and afternoon training tracks and a national convention luncheon. Registration is now open for Thursday's program at www.arrl.org forward slash expo and an early bird registration rate of $75 is in effect through December 15th. The National Convention training tracks are workshops providing an in-depth learning experience in one of the four track topics. Contest University is one of them. That's a first for Orlando. There's also Emergency Communications Academy, a hands-on handbook workshop, and a Technology Academy. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The National Convention training tracks are workshops providing an in-depth learning experience in one of the four track topics. Attendees will select a training track when completing their online National Convention registration. Here is an up-close look at the training tracks you can select. Training track number one, Contest University. This marks the first time Contest University is coming to Orlando. 
Registrants will learn from some of the top amateur radio contesters in the world. Contest University will appeal to new and veteran contesters alike who are looking to hone their skills. Presenters cover general contest operations, contesting skills, and many resources and tools to get more out of contesting. The track leaders are Tim Duffy, K3LR, and Terry Grizzer, K8MNJ. Presenters include ARRL US Virgin Islands Section Manager, Fred Kleber, K9VV stroke NP2X, Chris Blake, NX4N, Luis Romero, W4LT, Claudio Veroli, I4VEQ, and Max Fountain, KJ4EUT, who will offer a youth perspective on contesting. Training track number two, Emergency Communications Academy. Guest speakers from Amateur Radio Emergency Communications Training will present an overview of amateur radio response during disasters, message traffic handling, ARIES, OXCOM, WINLINK, emergency antennas, and emergency power. Participants will learn the skills and roles needed to be an effective volunteer. The track leader is Rick Palm, K1CE. Presenters include Gordon Gibby, KX4Z, Mike Walters, W8ZY, Kurt Bartholomew, N3GQ, Matthew Curtin, KD8TTE, Helen Strawn, WC4FSU, Leland Gallup, AA3YB, Earl McDowell, K4ZSW, and others. Training track number three, Hands-On Handbook. This workshop will include a series of presentations on a variety of amateur radio activities intended to inspire participants to be radioactive in new ways. Topics include parks on the air, remote station control and operating, amateur satellite communication, and HF digital modes. Training track number four, Technology Academy. Track leader Kristen McIntyre, K6WX, will be joined by technical experts in the amateur radio community, including ARRL lab manager Ed Hare, W1RFI. Topics will include antennas, radios, SWR grounds, and hints and hacks to keep our stations humming along at maximum efficiency. Registration includes the National Convention Luncheon, featuring a keynote address by ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA. The rest of the celebration continues at Hamcation on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, February 11th through the 13th, 2022 at Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando, an 87-acre lakefront fairgrounds. Tickets for Hamcation are sold separately and are available now. Orlando Amateur Radio Club President John Knott N4JTK notes that the 2022 convention marks the 75th anniversary of Hamcation, one of the largest annual gatherings of radio amateurs in the U.S. We want our Diamond Anniversary show to be an exciting five-star event, said Not. We look forward to seeing you in Orlando in February. For further details, visit the 2022 ARRL National Convention website at www.arrl.org expo and the Orlando Hamcation website at www.hamcation.com. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. The following is the October Volunteer Monitor Program report. Technician operators in Yarmouth Port, Massachusetts and Richmond, Texas received advisory notices after making numerous FT8 contacts on 40 and 80 meters. Technician licensees are not allowed to transmit on the data on the 40 meters and have no operating authority on 20 meters. Operators in Mims, Florida, Moorfield, West Virginia, State Road, North Carolina and Grottoes, Virginia 
received advisory notices concerning excessive SSB bandwidth on 40 and 75 meters. The operator in Moorfield, West Virginia, previously received an advisory notice for out-of-band operation on 7.138 megahertz. His case will be referred to the FCC for further enforcement action, which could include removal of voice privileges from or revocation of his general class license. An operator in Cave Creek, Arizona, received an advisory notice for making lengthy transmissions without identifying, as required by Commission rules. An operator in Highlandville, Missouri, was reminded that a beacon on 30 meters cannot be automatically controlled, pursuant to Part 97.203 of Subpart D of the Commission rules. It must have a control operator present at all times of transmission. He was further advised that the FCC may request a schedule of control operators and their duty hours. The final totals for monitoring in September were 1,909 hours on HF frequencies and 2,716 on VHF and above for a total of 4,625 hours. There was one recommendation to the FCC for case closure and renewal of a license and one request to review a license application. The FCC referred two cases to the Volunteer Monitor Program we thank VM Program Administrator Ryling Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this month's report. The French National Frequency Agency, ANFR, carries an announcement on its website that the amateur radio exam and the operator certificate in France will now be free of charge. This is applicable from the start of 2021. ANFR added that the terms and conditions for reimbursement of candidates enrolled in any of the examination sessions will soon be specified on the agency's portal. The agency said that if you've paid your examination fee for the amateur radio certificate and you're eligible for reimbursement, you will soon receive a letter detailing the documents to be provided in order to resolve the situation. There's more on the ANFR Amateur Radio page at www.anfr.fr and then follow the link to the Licensing and Authorizations page. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. IARU Region 1 Monitoring System Newsletter reports that October also brought us a large number of troublemakers that often massively interfere with amateur radio. With more on this story, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from Southgate Amateur Radio News in the UK. The IARU Region 1 Monitoring System Newsletter for October reports increased problems from the usual troublemakers that often massively interfere with amateur radio. Among them are the UK's HF over-the-horizon radar in Cyprus called Pluto. As always in the top slot for invasive QRM were the over-the-horizon radars, especially of course the well-known Russian one called Container. Also the British radar from the UK base in Cyprus was significantly more active than usual, particularly in the 15, 17 and 20 metre amateur bands, using 25 and 50 sweeps per second. Different over-the-horizon radars from China were present daily on several frequencies, most obviously the one known under the nickname Foghorn, which was also using different sweep rates, for example 20 or 50 sweeps per second, mostly 10 kHz wide, but additionally amateur radio was often badly degraded by a 160 kHz wideband radar with 10 sweeps per second, a real intrusion. The International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System Region 1 October 2021 newsletter can be read at www.iaru-r1.org and recordings of military transmissions can be found on the Signal Identification Guide Wiki at www.sigidwiki.com. The IARU Monitoring System webpage is at www.iarums-r1.org. Depending on propagation conditions, some well-known familiar broadcast stations were also audible almost daily in Europe, including Radio Ethiopia on 7110 kHz with an often very strong signal. Also, other stations were heard from time to time, if conditions permitted. Paul Maurer, VA6 MPM, treks across the Canadian Rockies, often for days at a time, alone. Faced with the prospect of being out of touch in the wilderness, amateur radio connects him to the outside world 
as he journeys beyond cell phone coverage. Maor has figured out how to travel light, and he enjoys activating summits on the air. But I realized fairly quickly in the, in the remote uh, Alpine Club of Canada huts that I was visiting, uh, VHF wasn't going to cut the mustard and I needed to get an HF license, which I did. Since that time, I've been carrying an HF radio to when I go into the backcountry because I do casual uh, custodial and maintenance work for the Alpine Club of Canada. So I'm, I'm back in the backcountry frequently. I enjoy that. And so I carry my radio with me in there as, as a means of communication. Thanks to QSO Today for that audio clip. The Administrative Council of the International Amateur Radio Union held its annual meeting in October. The Administrative Council, or AC, is responsible for the policy and management of the IARU and consists of the three IARU international officers and two representatives from each of the three IARU regional organizations. The Administrative Council traditionally meets in person following a regional conference. However, COVID restrictions still in place in many parts of the world required a virtual format for this meeting. Complete reports on IARU preparations for World Radio Conference 23 were presented. It was noted that many of the ITUR working parties have made less progress in virtual meetings than would have been the case with in-person meetings. However, more IARU volunteers have been able to follow the meetings online than would have been possible if travel had been required. A group was appointed to draft a paper to guide member societies in addressing possible revisions to so-called country footnotes in the radio regulations with their administrations. IARU continues to participate in the work of CISPR, the International Special Committee on Radio Interference. EMC coordinator Dr. Martin Sack, G8KDF, continues to work with CISPR to address the need for reasonable standards to limit the increasing threat of radio spectrum pollution from proliferating digital devices and wireless power transmission. IARU Beacon Project Coordinator Peter Jennings, AB6WM, stroke VE3SUN, provided a comprehensive written report on the status of the International Beacon Project, a HF timeshared beacon network that is supported by the Northern California DX Foundation and the IARU. The report highlighted the efforts of local groups and individuals to maintain and improve the system of beacon stations. IARU Satellite Coordinator Hans Blundiel Timmerman, PB2T, presented his report noting considerable time is required in explaining the need for an amateur radio mission to applicants for commercial satellite and educational satellite coordination. Without an amateur radio mission, the request cannot be granted. Emergency Communications Special Advisor Rod Stafford, W6ROD, reported on his work representing the IARU in the ITU development sector. The World Telecommunication Development Conference, scheduled for November 2021 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, has been postponed to 2022. In 2019, the Administrative Council formed a committee to address the growing pressure on amateur spectrum allocations, particularly on frequency bands at 144 MHz and above. The committee reported its findings to the Administrative Council, and a letter providing guidance on the matter was approved for distribution to member societies through the regional bodies. The AC received and approved the final report from its core mission working group. The recommendations will be reviewed for implementation by additional working groups focusing on the future of IARU. The AC bestowed the Michael J. Owen VK3KI Memorial Award to Don Beatty, G3BJ, for his many years of work with the IARU supporting the amateur radio services worldwide. The AC also bestowed the IARU Diamond Award to Gopal Madhavan, VU2GMN, stroke M0GDB, and Ken Yamamoto, JA1CJP, for their long record of exemplary service to the IARU and their respective member societies. An in-person administrative council meeting is planned for early 2022. According to the Wireless Institute of Australia, 74 years after two amateur radio operators opened their retail doors as the New Zealand electronics business known as Jackson & Wills, the company has been sold. Jackson & Wills, which is located in Invercargill, bears the names of Douglas Jackson, ZL4GM, and Maurice Wills, ZL4GY, who became friends through amateur radio after World War II. In recent years, the company was run by the second generation, Maurice's son Lindsay. Lindsay, who worked at Jackson and Wills for 34 years, noted that the inventory gradually shifted from analog to digital equipment, reflecting the changes in technology. The buyer 
Ashley Communications has been in business since the 1930s and was among the first to sell the original Tate mobile radios. According to a story on the Southland Times website, the Jackson and Will staff will remain on the job after the sale closes. Norway is planning to introduce a 10-watt entry-level license that will enable young people 12 to 13 years old to get started building simple transmitters and receivers. The Norwegian Research Council has given 1 million kroner, or approximately $116,000, to support the project to recruit young radio hams. A translation of the post by Sweden's SSA reads thusly, Within the framework of its program, Strength of Children and Young People's Digital Competence and Understanding of Digital Technology, the Norwegian Research Council has allocated one million kroner to the project Radio Communications Technology for Young People. The project is carried out by the NRRL and the Research Institute of Forsvaret, and the project manager is Toborn Skali, LA4ZCA. The project aims to increase interest in technology and science in schools. The idea is to introduce amateur radio as a kind of freely chosen work in the high school. The project also includes developing an entry-level certificate that allows 12- and 13-year-olds to get started with amateur radio. Norway's communications regulator, NKOM, has received clear directives, and work is now being done to design certificate requirements and conditions. The project has a clear focus on the makerspace phenomena and would like to encourage young people to start by building simple transmitters and receivers. Therefore, you want a low power limit of a maximum of 10 watts to avoid interference from home-built appliances. Jaborn, who is the professor at FFI, has previous experience from voluntary code workshops in this school where children are taught to program. An important challenge to programming, makerspaces, and amateur radio has to be dedicated and trained teachers who can drive the business forward once the project has ended. SSA looks forward to interesting cooperation with NRRL in this area. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Oh, that's cute. There's a girl learning how to roller skate outside. Uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, there she goes. Uh, that's cute. I think her boyfriend's teaching her how to roller skate. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see what happened this week. Chip shortage continuing. Lots of, uh, lots of thoughts about why there's a shortage. It's not just a chip shortage, shortage of everything. I saw one car manufacturer is going to stop putting in uh, seat warmers in their cars so they can ship the cars because it's one little chip. They just can't get that chip. And so they figure, oh, the heck with it. <laughs> we'll just, we just won't put seat warmers in that, in those vehicles and, uh, we can ship the cars. It's that kind of thing. Modern vehicles have a lot of microprocessors in there. And, uh, for a variety of reasons, there's shortages. COVID certainly part of it. Plants and critical factories. The problem really is, um, a lot of these chips, like, I would imagine, as I would imagine, the uh, the chip that warms your seat in your car are what we call legacy nodes. They're old. They're not the chip everybody's talking about, the new Intel Alder Lake. They're not the Apple M1 Pro Silicon. No, they're not that. Those, in fact, don't seem to be in a particularly short supply. It's the the little things, the chips that convert audio from bits into uh, analog waves so the speakers or the headphones can play them things like that there's like one factory in taiwan that makes it and it burned down six months ago and they haven't fixed it yet of course you know what follows a shortage a glut <laughs> and what's happening right now is companies like intel the uh, taiwan silicon manufacturing company tsmc that makes the apple chips and others are building plants as fast as they can and as fast as capital lets them, because they're very expensive, $10 billion and more for these chip plants. But it takes a couple of three years to build them. So in a couple of three years, there's going to be a glut. You're going to have two seat warmers in every seat. You're going to... Uh, usually glut means drop in prices. We'll see. You heard it here first. Drop in prices. That's one reason 
according to the Wall Street Journal, that uh, companies aren't rushing to solve this chip shortage is price fluctuation. They're just not sure. Is it going to be a, a good investment to build a $10 billion factory if, if in three years there's, there's so many chips that you can't charge as much for them? That'll be interesting. It's affecting every market, including the used car market. Prices of used... Have you noticed this? Look in the back of your paper or your Craigslist or what. Prices of used cars have jumped over the last month 9.2%. That means it's 38% higher than a, this time a year ago. 38% higher. And the reason is people can't get new cars. They need cars. So they're buying used cars. And, of course, this is basic economics, isn't it? Shortage means increased prices. It's an interesting, and you know, I think there's a temptation to say, well, it's all because of X, but it's not. It's a lot of things. Demand went up during COVID. People bought lots of technology because, they're, you know, they're working at home and so forth. So that's part of it as well. One of the other things uh, we saw during COVID is a desperate need for Internet access, isn't it? And the infrastructure bill that the president's going to sign is going to provide a lot of money to beef up internet. That's part of the roads and the transit. $65 billion, $65 billion to building up internet. I have to say, I'm a little nervous about this. Yes, it's a good thing. Yes, internet should be, as the United Nations declared some years ago, a human right. It's not just a luxury anymore. It's how we do, it's how we go to school. It's how we do business. It's just, uh, it's it's how we learn about what's going on in the world. It is a very, obviously, very important. Many of you listen to this show over the internet. Important to me too. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, in effect, I've been asking for something like the Tennessee Valley Authority. You remember in the, maybe you don't, I don't, but in the Great Depression, of course, we also had a bunch of infrastructure bills trying to keep people get people to work and so forth. And one of the things that was observed in the 30s, 20s and 30s, was uh, electricity wasn't widespread. A lot of the rural areas weren't electrified. And uh, at that point, we, we kind of all decided collectively, you know what, electricity should be a human right. You shouldn't have to live without electricity. So that was one of the things we spent a lot of money on as a, as a nation, is rural electrification. Things like the Tennessee Valley Authority. And I've been saying that we should do this rural internetification. We should have a TVA for the internet. And I guess that's kind of what this is. $62 billion. The only thing that, or $65 billion, the only thing that makes me a little nervous, I would love to see some, some or if not all of this money go to municipal internet, state run internet, not to the big internet companies, but most of it's going to go to Comcast. <sighs> Psy and AT&T, the big telecom companies, they're going to apply. They're going to say, well, yeah, give us some money and we'll build out these uh, the infrastructure in these rural areas. And that makes me so, so nervous because I, we've seen this before. Unfortunately, we've seen this before where where these big companies go, oh, yeah, thank you very much. Put it in their pockets. Then do as little as possible. Some of this money is going to go to lowering broadband costs for low income households. It's not going to be as much money as before. I think it was, was it, was the subsidy was 50 or 60 bucks a month for a low income household. If you're more than 200% below the poverty line, that'll be 30 bucks. But hey, that's better than no bucks, which is what was going to happen. States are going to get large grants to pay for internet improvements, but the states are just going to pass them along, I think, uh, in most cases to broadband providers who, surprise, surprise, are expressing support for the bill. <laughs> Why do I get the image of them gleefully rubbing their hands going, yes, it's excellent. We are encouraged, says uh, the National, uh, the NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. We are encouraged that the bipartisan infrastructure deal directly addresses two critical elements of reaching universal connectivity, dedicating funding first and foremost to those regions without any broadband service. Yes, excellent. And providing financial assistance to help low-income Americans subscribe to this critical service. Oh, that goes in our pockets, too. Oh, that's good. So um, the good news is we'll get more as a as a requirement to get this money. We'll have we'll get more information about who's getting Internet. We don't know that, you know, you could have a fiber optic line going right by your house. Doesn't mean you've got Internet from it. Right. They haven't necessarily wired you up. So providers will have to have a 
provide that information to the Federal Communications Commission. And there's going to be, like the food labels, there's going to be a uniform label to describe offerings and prices. That's much needed. Because if you've ever looked at your internet bill and tried to figure it out, good luck. Good luck. The Emergency Broadband Benefit Program will, will get extended. It's $30 instead of 50 Okay. States are going to get some of that money to fund internet improvements. I hope the states use it instead of just giving it to Comcast. Here, you fix it. Internet service providers that receive federal grant money will be required to offer low-cost service. And then there's $2.75 billion for the Digital Equity Act, which will help states develop comprehensive plans to ensure equal access to the internet for historically underserved communities. It all sounds really good. We just kind of watch carefully to see what happens. I'm, I'm trying not to be cynical. So easy, isn't it? Anyway, that's, you know, I think that's good. Do you agree? Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. In our last installment, we reviewed the events that took place between 1951 and 1953. In that two-year period, the Class A, B, and C licenses had been renamed the Advanced, General, and Conditional Class licenses, respectively. Three new licenses had been created, the Extra, Technician, and Novice. Also during that period, 40 meters was finally opened to phone operation after being a CW-only band for years. We lost the top 50 kilocycles of 20 meters, but gained our new 15-meter band. The Advanced class was closed to new applicants, although those holding this license could still renew. And in a surprising decision, the FCC opened all phone bands to the general and conditional class operators. Previously, holders of Class B and C licenses could only operate HF phone on 10 meters. Now all amateurs, conditional to extra class, had the same on-the-air operating privileges. Many amateurs resented the fact that the advanced and extra class operators had no exclusive frequencies and that there was no incentive for a general or conditional class license to upgrade. Some of these complaints filtered their way to the ARRL. And so, in the February 1963 issue of QST, an editorial appeared in which the ARRL expressed regret over the abandonment of the incentive license structure called the 1952 decision a step backward and proposed a new incentive licensing system be implemented. The idea of exclusive frequencies for advanced and extra class hams at the expense of the generals and conditionals drew volumes of mail in response. Some of the comments printed in QST included, absolutely outrageous, ridiculous, your editorial hits the nail on the head, thought provoking, Congratulations to the ARRL and to hell with the ARRL. The responses in QST were about evenly split for and against. There were a few letters from generals and conditionals who supported the idea of incentive licensing, even though they would clearly lose under the proposal. On May 3, 1963, the ARRL Board of Directors adopted their official position on incentive licensing. Their proposal would completely take away all general and conditional class phone privileges on 75, 40, 20, and 15 meters in a two-year phase-in period. In other words, the ARRL's incentive licensing would only allow HF phone operation for generals and conditionals on 10 meters and on the small sliver of 160 meters that was available in the days of Loran radio navigation. The ARRL also suggested reopening the advanced class license again to those who held a general or conditional class license for one year. Strangely, the ARRL did not suggest that extras be given exclusive frequencies, nor did they propose exclusive CW frequencies for the extras. Rather, they just wanted exclusive access to the 75 through 15 meter phone segments for the advanced and extra class licenses. 
Again, the mail poured in pro and con. Many hams felt betrayed for, at this time, the ARRL was running a building fund drive to raise $250,000 to construct the headquarters that now stands at 225 Main Street in Newington, Connecticut. In effect, they believe the ARRL was saying, thanks for your donation, now say goodbye to your HF phone privileges. They were not happy. On April 1, 1965, the FCC, in response to the ARRL proposal and proposals submitted by others, released their own version of incentive licensing. For generals and conditionals, the FCC proposal was not as bad as the leagues. The FCC would take away about 50% of their phone frequencies on 75 through 15 meters, but they would still have access to half of each phone band. For the advanced class license, formerly Class A, it was a disaster. The FCC, instead of reopening the advanced class, proposed creating a new amateur first class. This license would have a code speed of 16 words per minute. Worse, the FCC would bump the present advanced class operators down to general upon renewal. Now it was the advanced class licensees who were outraged. Prior to 1952, they had held the top license. Now, in effect, they would be demoted two grades and lose 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. The FCC also proposed exclusive 50 kilocycle CW subbands for extra class licensees on 80 through 15 meters, small exclusive phone segments for extras, and incentive restrictions on 6 and 2 meters. For the next two years, 1965 through 1967, the battle raged on. Hundreds of proposals and counter-proposals were made. The ARRL opposed any incentive subbands on 6 and 2 meters and worked to retain the advanced class in lieu of the proposed amateur first class license. On August 24, 1967, the FCC announced its decision. There would not be a new amateur first class ticket or a 16 word per minute requirement. The advanced class would not be demoted to general but rather would be reopened as the intermediate step between the general and extra. In summary, the FCC rules established a three-step phase-in of incentive licensing to begin on November 22, 1967. On that day, the advanced class was reopened to new applicants after a 15-year freeze, and novices were given a two-year non-renewable license instead of the previous one-year non-renewable term. On November 22, 1968, novices lost their two-meter voice privileges. Generals, conditionals, and technicians lost the first 100 kilocycles of 6 meters. The first 25 kilocycles of the 80 through 15 meter CW bands became extra only, and generals and conditionals lost about 25% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands, which were given to the advanced and extra class hams. Comments and opinions still poured into the FCC and the ARRL, requesting anything from total abandonment of incentive licensing to even more restrictive allocations. Most of the comments suggested that the third phase, scheduled for implementation on November 22, 1969, was too severe. Upon review, the Commission agreed in part. Thus, on September 24, 1969, the FCC scaled back the schedule changes. As a result, technicians, conditionals, and generals did not lose the 50.1 through 50.25 megacycle segment of 6 meters, where most of the sideband activity was, and the extra class CW subbands were kept at 25 kilocycles. After November 22, 1969, generals and conditionals had only 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands, advanced had about 90%, and extra class licenses retained 100% of their previous allocations. On a final note, the FCC in its report and order adopting incentive licensing had refused to increase the VHF operating privileges for technicians and had taken away novice voice operations on two meters. There was a reason for this. The FCC wanted novices to bypass the technician class license and go right to general. Why? In our next installment, we will journey back to the amateur world in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s 
to take a closer look at the Technician Class license and the unique position it held. I hope you'll be with me. The RSGB held its second online convention on Saturday the 9th of October. There's now a new video, the RSGB 2021 convention unwrapped, on the RSGB's YouTube channel, which gives you a behind-the-scenes look at how the Society created the event. It also includes quotes from viewers and presenters, as well as some statistics to show just how many thousands of people engaged with it during the day. Months of planning went into this online event, which provides 15 presentations across two live streams throughout the day, as well as regular content from the RSGB National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park. Feedback from viewers across the world has been overwhelmingly positive. The RSGB was delighted so many radio amateurs joined the live event on the day, and that thousands more are still viewing the individual presentations on its YouTube channel. The RSGB says, see you next year. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. Time now for the AMSAT report. A lot of new hams are venturing into amateur radio satellites. Whether you prefer CW, SSB, FM, or digital, there's a satellite to suit your taste. Unlike solar flares and all other different layers of the atmosphere, satellite operators only have to worry about the satellite's footprint, its coverage on the face of the Earth. If you're in the footprint and the satellite elevation is high enough for your antennas to see it, you can work through that satellite. Satellite passes are short. They last anywhere from a few minutes if you're on the edge of a footprint to about 20 minutes if the satellite is passing directly overhead. Good starter satellites are the FM Easy Sats, which include some APRS satellites. The CWSSB satellites are a bit more challenging. To get answers to your questions, the AMSAT Bulletin Board is a wealth of knowledge. Someone there will be able to help you through the learning process. Go to amsat.org and click on Services to subscribe. And AMSAT wishes everyone a happy Thanksgiving. The AMSAT Report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. A report in Yahoo News says that an American middle school project to build a miniature satellite is now taking pictures from 250 miles above Earth. The project was born around Christmas 2014. That's when two men, who first became friends years ago at Oak Ridge High School, had a chance conversation at their local church. They were Todd Livesey, a science and technology teacher at Robertsville Middle School, and Patrick Hull, an aeronautical engineer at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Hull suggested that the two work together on an educational project. The culmination of the students' efforts, guided by mentors, was RAMSAT, a miniature CubeSat satellite named after the middle school mascot, and it's now cruising in outer space. The story of Ramsat and a progress report were presented recently by Todd Livesey and three mentors during a public meeting of Orion, their local amateur astronomy organization. Starting in 2016, mentors for the students were recruited from Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the Y-12 National Security Complex. Other recruits included parents and David Andrews, a ham radio operator. On June the 3rd, 2021, six and a half years after the Livesey Hull reunion at Christmas, during which 235 middle school students had the opportunity to handle Ramsat's many components, the RMS CubeSat was launched by a SpaceX rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Some 24 hours later, Ramsat reached the International Space Station for subsequent launch. You can read the full Yahoo story at autos.yahoo.com. And now, with this week's propagation forecast report, we go back to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who reports from League Headquarters. Isn't it always the way the big DX contest and talking about the CQWWDXCW is looming? And dag nabbit, does anybody really say that? The sun is not cooperating. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle reports, new sunspots appeared on November 14th and 16th, but solar activity was lower as was geomagnetic activity. Average daily sunspot numbers declined from 36.4 last week to 30.9 in the November 11th through the 17th reporting week. 
predicted solar flux averages will hover around 80 into early December. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, offers her take on things. And keep in mind, sometimes space weather can change fast. We've really kind of quieted down when it comes to solar flux. We're sitting in the high 80s right now, moving into the mid 80s, and likely it's going to stay like that easily through the end of this week and into next week before we start seeing more regions rotate into view that could actually boost that solar flux back up again. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. 22 radio amateurs from the Western Placer Amateur Radio Club in Lincoln, California, provided communication and other support for the Rotary Club of Lincoln Tour de Lincoln charity bicycle event on October 30th. The Tour de Lincoln consists of three routes, 25 kilometer, 50 kilometer, and 100 kilometer rides through the hills of Lincoln, California. At least 425 riders participated in this year's event, with 230 of them on the 100 kilometer route. The mayor of Lincoln participated in the 50 kilometer ride. This was the 14th year that Western Placer Amateur Radio Club volunteers have supported the event. Our goal is to help the cyclists, their support crews, and their families have a safe and enjoyable event, said Roger Brunquill, K6OU, the club coordinator for the event. Similar to a real emergency event, we have to be flexible in our planning and execution. In addition to communication, the Western Placer Amateur Radio Club radio operators are able to help with basic bicycle repairs or to transport a broken bike and or an overly fatigued rider back to base. The participating ham radio operators get to dust off their event and emergency communication skills by providing support which Brunquill said is greatly appreciated by the writers and the Lincoln community. The Western Placer Amateur Radio Club K6PAC repeater serves as the communications backbone, with two alternate repeaters in the area available for tactical and emergency use. This year we had 14 support and gear units on the course and hams at the three rest stops, Brunquill said. All ham radio vehicles on the course and at rest stops bore support and gear signs printed on bright orange cardstock so riders could flag them for help, he explained. We take our responsibilities very seriously, but have a lot of fun at the same time. One of our rules as a club is that we never leave our assigned positions as long as there is a rider on the course, said Michael Buck, K6BUK who leads the net control team for the event. At net control, we log the time and content of every communication. The net control station was located at the event's base and the rider's starting and ending point. The experienced team of three net control operators set up a station, ran the event, and interacted with the event director, from coordinating vehicle rollout to staffing rest stop relay stations checking out first aid and mechanical kits, and preparing for the event. Many of the Western Placer Amateur Radio Club radio operators have been helping with the event for over 10 years. Every year we add a few new radio operators, which helps our continuity of operations for the subsequent years, Brunquell emphasized. But what makes the amateur radio portion of the event so successful is those who come back year after year. They know the routine, they just need updates, course changes, and additional training determined from the last year. After the event, the volunteers evaluate what went well and what improvements are needed. Rotary Club of Lincoln Event Director Brian Ludwig told Brunquill that some writers said the ham radio support was an order of magnitude better than what they had experienced in other cycle events and made them feel safe. CW Ops is now accepting nominations for its 2022 award for advancing the art of CW. This prestigious award recognizes individuals, groups, or organizations that have made the greatest contributions towards advancing the art or practice of radio communication using Morse code. 
The candidates may be authors of publications related to CW, CW recruiters, trainers, mentors, coaches, and instructors, public advocates of CW, organizers of CW activities, designers and inventors who advance the art or practice of CW, or others who contribute to the art or practice of CW. This award is not limited to radio amateurs or their organizations. Anyone may submit a nomination to awards at cwops.org with a copy to secretary at cwops.org. Submissions will be acknowledged via email. Nominations must be received by March 18th of 2022 and include a detailed explanation supporting the nominee's qualifications, name and call sign, and contact information. Also include the name, call sign, and email address of the individual submitting the nomination. The award will be presented at Dayton Hamvention. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio As you might know, I like to transmit with as little power as possible, known as QRP operation. My own station runs at 5 watts, since on HF that's as low as my radio will go. I could go lower by turning down the microphone gain, which interestingly is how some radios actually operate, but for now 5 watts seems to be a good starting point, and truth be told, even though I've been here for a while, I feel like I'm learning something new every day. One of the largest challenges associated with using low power on HF is propagation on the HF bands, which is more fluid than ever. There's plenty of variables. For example, in addition to the day-night cycle, there's Earth's magnetic field, the impact from coronal mass ejections, as well as the solar cycle. As that cycle waxes and wanes, or in my case wanes and waxes, propagation trends are affected on a longer-term basis. There's all manner of tools to explore this. The Australian Space Weather Service is one of many such bodies that create ionospheric prediction maps, showing frequencies and their propagation through the ionosphere. Then there's the derivative ones that use this data to declare if a band is open or closed, spread widely across the globe with little in the way of context, like time or location. There are tools like VOACAP which attempt to predict the point-to-point -point path loss and transceiver coverage dependent on antennas, solar weather and time and date. They also attempt to arrive at a so-called MUF, the maximum usable frequency, defined as the highest frequency at which ionospheric communication is possible for 50% of the days in a month. The LUF, the lowest usable frequency, is defined as the frequency at which communication is possible 90% of the days of the month. All these tools have one thing in common. They're predictions and forecasts. They reflect an attempt at quantifying reality. There is a place for this, but my often repeated encouragement of getting an air to make some noise is advice that covers the gap between prediction and reality. I've long been a fan of using Weak Signal Propagation Reporter or Whisper as a tool to measure actual propagation. What I like most about it is that it can be used on your own station using your own antenna at any time. It occurred to me the other day that there must be a relationship between a whisper signal and a voice signal. Not a mathematical one, but one that makes the difference between establishing a voice contact with another station and calling CQ until you're blue in the face. With that in mind, I took a leap and purchased a Zactec desktop whisper transmitter, capable of operating on all the HF bands that my license permits. It was shipped from Sweden this week, and it is expected to take more than a month to get to me, likely most of that travelling between Sydney and Perth, but when it does, I'll be able to set up my own in-house 200 milliwatt beacon that will show me just how far my signal goes on the bands that I pick. As an aside, I'm still looking for a similar solution for 2 meters and 70 centimeters, since there are all manner of interesting propagation phenomena associated with those bands as well. I'm still digging into how I can best gather the reception data to visualize it, and I'm working on a strategy that can send me an alert when a particular band is open from my station at such a level that I can look to operating a particular mode, like FT8 or SSB or anything that I might choose. The data is public thanks to the various whisper reporting systems around, so others in my grid square, likely beyond that, will also be able to benefit from my beacon. 
I'm considering generating a propagation map from my own station and publish that, but it's too early to say what's involved in making that happen. Right now, I've dived into the rabbit hole associated with finding a suitable antenna. My current station vertical requires a tuner, and I don't think that finding a way to tune my antenna every time the beacon changes band is a good solution. I suspect that I'll also need to come up with a way to have two transmitters share the same antenna, but I'll cross that bridge when I need to. Once the beacon arrives, it's my intention to start with 10 meters as my beacon band using my current antenna, since 10 meters is on the verge of being useful for my QRP adventures, and I must confess I'm looking forward to making a voice contact with the other side of the planet with my station for the first time in a long time. What kind of things can you think of that would benefit from a solution like this? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Low CQ, low CQ, CQ POTA, CQ Parks on the air. From Kilo 8 Hotel, Quebec, activating K3331. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike with your month ending October 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, in October we welcomed Ireland and India to Parks on the Air, so please join me in saying Gia Hoich and Namaste to our newest Poda friends. Also in Poda news, October was another record-setting month with an all-time high for both number of activators and number of QSOs, with 1,630 activators making a combined 329,019 QSOs. Poda is excited to officially announce that for our 2022 Summer Plaque event, we will be adding several plaques for DX QSOs. There will be up to six DX plaques available pending sponsorship one each for most QSOs made as an activator outside of the continental United States for IARU regions 1, 2, and 3, and one each for hunters that make the most QSOs with activators in those same regions. If you or your organization is interested in sponsoring one of these new DX plaques in 2022, please send an email to n3vem at parksontheair.com for details. And now for our monthly stats update. As we mentioned in our news item, October was yet another record-setting month for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 329,000 contacts made by over 1,600 activators. These activators put over 3,600 Parks on the Air from 27 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were KB3WAV with 3,631 QSOs and KU8T who activated 72 different Parks. The top hunter for the month was KC4TVZ with 1,541 QSOs while hunting 971 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Canada was once again the most active entity outside of the continental United States with 18,471 QSOs. The most active entity outside of North America was Japan with 5,045 QSOs. The top DX activators for the month were VE3GKT with 1,834 QSOs and VE7NB who activated 40 parks. Outside of North America, the top activator was JF7RJM with 1,205 QSOs from 31 different parks. For October 2021, we're introducing the first of our monthly bonus features. This segment will cover a variety of short format topics in a variety of ways. This month we'll be sharing an FYI corner topic, multi-park activations. To understand twofers, threefers, etc., we need to first recall the very first rule of POTA. The activator and all of the equipment you use must be within the perimeters of the park and on public property. By way of example, if you have two parks that overlap and the operator sets up all of their equipment in the overlapping area, this counts as a twofer and two logs can be submitted, one for each park. If, however, the operator's equipment is outside of the overlapping area, Park 2 would not count as being activated because the first rule of POTA, being entirely inside the bounds of the park, has not been satisfied for that park. For parks that do not overlap but are simply adjacent to each other, a twofer cannot be done because there is no way to set up your equipment to satisfy the rule number one for both parks. Activating mobile from the side of a public road that has a park on either side presents the same issue as our previous example because there is no way to be physically inside the bounds of both parks at the same time. 
If, however, the public road passes through a place where both parks overlap and there is a safe place to pull over and activate, you can do so for two for credit by submitting two logs, one for each park. We hope that this short topic has clarified any questions you might have around twofers or threefers. Again, simply remember the very first rule of POTA. The activator and all of the equipment you use must be within the perimeters of the park and on public property. This concludes our October 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. Last November, NASA called for proposal submissions to document the story of Artemis II mission to the moon. Amateur Radio Exploration, or AREX, a joint initiative of amateur radio on the International Space Station and AMSAT, submitted its plan to fly hardware and cameras on the lunar mission. Although NASA did not select the Eric's proposal, Aries USA Executive Director Frank Bauer, Kilo Alpha 3 Hotel Delta Oscar, found a silver lining in the whole process. Bauer said the Eric's team learned a great deal in the development of the proposal and was able to significantly refine its lunar payload design into a concept that can now meet lunar gateway payload requirements. When NASA next returns astronauts to the moon, National Geographic cameras will document the historic space mission in order to share it with the public. On October 29th, NASA announced its selection of the exploration-focused media company to assist in telling the story of Artemis II. Like Apollo 8, Artemis II will be the first planned human spaceflight mission in more than 50 years to orbit the moon and return to Earth. This time, we are bringing partners and technologies that will create additional opportunities for the world to share in the experience along with our astronauts, said Kathy Luters, NASA Associate Administrator for Space Operations Mission Directorate. Through its proposal entitled, The Excitement and Inspiration of Artemis Journeys to the Worldwide Audience Through Interactive Amateur Video Experiences, Erex wanted to evolve its design to make sure it meets all known NASA gateway requirements, which, at the beginning of the proposal development, we were not meeting, Bauer said. He said its revised payload design concept will position the Eric's Eric's team to respond to future lunar opportunity requests, as well as to communicate its readiness to fly payload on the Lunar Gateway mission. Bauer said Eric went into the proposal process knowing there was a high possibility that an organization like National Geographic might propose. But you can never be sure, he said, adding that Eric's also did not want to miss any lunar opportunity. What we did learn was that we could develop a hardware concept that can meet the volume, mass, and power requirements of the gateway, and that we could develop an antenna scheme that would not require an antenna pointing system and still have some decent gain towards Earth. NASA's Lunar Gateway will be an orbiting lunar outpost and will provide vital support for a long-term human return to the lunar surface, as well as a staging point for deep space exploration. It is a critical component of NASA's Artemis program. On behalf of the Eric's team, my thanks to all who supported the maturation of our lunar design and the development and submission of the proposal, Bauer said. On the cleantechnica.com website, there's an interesting and wide-ranging article by Jennifer Sensiba, Kilo 3 Juliet Echo November, reminding us that the QRP, or low-power, corner of the amateur radio hobby has been pioneering doing something with almost nothing for decades. She writes that to better understand how these radio hams she affectionately terms efficiency nerds have helped the world, we need to look at what it's possible to do now. It turns out that the work of the sometimes maligned energy efficiency hobbyists can do a lot of good in the world. Some of them have worked to see just how little power they can use to exchange messages around the world, and this is known in the ham world as QRP. The challenge is to communicate using 5 watts of radio frequency power or less. The easiest thing in the beginning was to use better and better antenna systems to get the most range out of those precious 5 watts. But the use of Morse code and then computer data communications allowed the power levels to go even lower. But as computers have become more capable, signal analysis has improved to the point where some operators are sending signals thousands of miles with only a few millionths of a watt. 
The most extreme operators use special modes where the signal takes hours to send and receive, but the discoveries they've made and the methods they pioneered made it possible for more practical and useful messages to be sent in just a few seconds with 4 to 5 watts. With abundant electrical power available, even from little solar panels in the poorest parts of the planet, what these hobbyists have been doing for the last couple of decades may seem silly to most of us. Getting a million miles per watt of power does seem kind of ridiculous, but their work pioneered new knowledge and new methods that later became useful tools for people doing practical emergency work. K3JEN concludes by saying that to achieve a good transition to renewable energy, we need as much efficiency as we can get. If we only have enough battery minerals and grid capacity for a few big cars, we won't succeed. If we have efficient vehicles that use less minerals and put little to no strain on the grid, that puts us closer. She says that instead of mocking efficiency hobbyists, we need to embrace their approach. You can read her full article at cleantechnica.com. NASA this week welcomed its newest astronauts in space, who also happen to be amateurs. Congratulations to Raja Kari, KI-5-LIU, the newest commander of a NASA space mission. Raja and his three fellow members of SpaceX Crew-3 are now aboard the International Space Station, having made the trip aboard the Endurance, which launched on Wednesday, November 10th. According to the Associated Press, the U.S. Air Force test pilot from Iowa is the first rookie to command a NASA space mission in several decades. The mission is expected to last for six months. It promises to be a busy six months for the crew, which includes Matthias Maurer, KI-5 KFH from the European Space Agency. The German astronaut will be involved in more than 35 experiments while on board the ISS. He will also be using the German call sign DP-0 ISS during a dozen scheduled contacts with German schools through the amateur radio on the International Space Station program. The first of those contacts is set for a school in Bavaria somewhere between the 29th of November and the 5th of December. GB-102ZE and GB-2ZE will be on December 1st through the 26th to mark the first personal message sent across the Atlantic Ocean from ham to ham on December 12th, 1921. In Scotland that day was 2ZE Paul Godley, who went to the UK representing ARRL to attempt the test. The Andros and Scotland area Crocodile Rock Amateur Group is handling this commemorative operation. With authorization from the U.S. Navy's Third Fleet Spectrum Manager, the Battleship Iowa Amateur Radio Association Incorporated and the Iowa's Innovation and Engineering Team will activate the ship's legacy Navy NEPM call sign on December 7th, 2021, 1600 to 2359 UTC to commemorate Pearl Harbor Day. NEPM will transmit on 14.781.5 and listen on 14.343. The ARRL New England and Roanoke divisions will have new directors on January 1st. The results of these three-way contested elections for director were announced on November 19th after ballots were tallied at ARRL headquarters. In the New England division, incumbent Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR, received 1,054 votes. Past director Tom Frenier, K1KI, received 1,026 votes. And challenger Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC, received 1,147 votes. Mr. Kemmerer was declared the winner. In the Roanoke division, incumbent George W. Bud Hippisley, W2RU, received 809 votes. Past director Dr. Jim Boner, N2ZZ received 1,612 votes, and challenger Marvin Hoffman, WA4NC, received 1,294 votes. Dr. Boner was declared the winner. All newly affected officials take office at noon on January 1st, 2022. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. Labre, the Brazil Amateur Radio Society, reports that on Sunday, October the 31st, the State Network of Emergency Radio Amateurs in Altinopolis, Sao Paulo, provided support during a disaster. 28 civilian firefighters were carrying out an exercise in the Two Mouths Cave when part of the cave collapsed, leaving nine dead and victims buried. 
The search and rescue operations were carried out by the Fire Department of Sao Paulo with the support of state civil defence. Radio amateurs had important participation by providing communications between the command post, installed about 800 metres from the cave, and the rescue area, which was difficult to access. To get to the cave itself, it took between 30 and 40 minutes of narrow trail walking through dense forest. The ham radio volunteers were involved in the work in the early hours of the morning and continued through to 8pm. The participation of the radio amateurs was effective, providing infrastructure and radio equipment to enable communication between the operations command and the rescue teams who had been without contact due to the lack of telephone signal or internet. The support of the radio amateurs brought greater agility to the operations, enabling the command to receive and transmit messages directly to the rescue team. Around 15 amateurs took part in the rescue, providing radio support via a number of technologies, including DMR, analog repeaters, and managing cross-linking technology to the app Zello. The team also had the support of dozens of other radio amateurs who supplied information and technical data. If you want to find out more about the amateur radio role in the rescue operations, go to tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Brazil. A Wyoming county has its new emergency communications trailer put to the test by hams. In Wyoming, radio operators have just completed a test that will help their county respond better to emergencies. A large trailer could be seen parked in the lot at the Sheridan Community Land Trust trailhead on November 13th but its presence had nothing to do with any hiker using the Wyoming Trail. Sheridan County Emergency Management had parked the vehicle, its new Ecom trailer, to conduct communications testings with the assistance of volunteers from the Cloud Peak Amateur Radio and Electronics Group, WY7SHR. The test was particularly vital to the fire and law enforcement departments as well as EMS. Ryan Curry, WY7RDC, Cloud Peak's president, said that the county asked the hams to participate so they would become familiar with operations in the trailer, which, in fact, they helped build. The hams' involvement was also needed because of their ability to set up cross-patch communications if the dispatch center or primary frequencies fail. It was a long day with an important mission. Ryan said the test was a first for the club, which deployed three amateurs to operate mobile and kept one at a base station monitoring the club's repeater as a backup. Following the fire warden's maps, the hams used county HTs to determine the limits of communication coverage at various locations pinpointing any dead spots. The club is looking for more amateurs to participate in their emergency communications activities. Please visit their website at cloudspeakradio.org if you're interested. The German National Society, DARC, says that the recent flood disasters in the Rhineland have shown that functioning communication in crisis situations is of great importance, but having a response ready to go is not a matter of course. The DARC Department for Emergency and Disaster Radio has taken the experience from the affected areas as an opportunity to develop a concept for future support of the population in such emergency situations. Oliver Schlag, Delta Lima 7, Tango November Yankee, the DARC's Federal Officer for Emergency and Disaster Radio, said that in times of prolonged communication failure, a team would be prepared in order to be able to support the population and independent helpers on site. The DARC has taken a concept that many external helpers developed from the fields of business, aid organisations, the fire brigade, the German armed forces and politics. The focus is on building up and maintaining a base of resources at the federal level, as well as expanding the regional emergency amateur radio groups. The aim is to build up a pool of material and helpers who can then set up and operate a temporary network with access to the internet, for example, for the benefit of citizens in the damaged areas. In the coming months, volunteers will set up the prototype of such a regional emergency radio group and its support at federal level. To launch its first steps, they will use financial resources from DARC membership. The DARC board has decided that the money will be used to support this project in the coming year. In order to achieve maximum visibility and response from the public, the prototype plan is to be presented nationwide in the second phase. The desire is to find external donors for the expansion of the prototype to cover the whole of Germany. 
DL7TNY said that an active emergency radio system that broadly supports society is good evidence that we radio amateurs can use the frequencies assigned to us responsibly and in the interests of the community. But we are also dependent on help from business and politics, he concluded. Further information can be found in the news section of DARC.DE. The Fairlawn, New Jersey Amateur Radio Club recently hosted a coffee talk with Larry Van Horn and 5FPW, an expert on monitoring military communications, including via satellite. Here's just a little bit of what he had to say. There's sometimes some very interesting communications down in the what we call the Federal Military LMR, which is the uh, land mobile uh, radio low band frequencies from 30 to 50 megahertz, right below the six meter band. The primary mode that most of the military aircraft do use down there are going to be, believe it or not, FM. You may hear a 10 communications down there. You may hear aircraft on various bombing ranges around the country. You may hear aircraft from other places around the world. When the Iraq conflict broke out and we were sending armor into Iraq, this band was hot with tank activity. Some of it was in the clear, most of it was not, but it was still interesting to be able to know what was going on and just, just to be able to sort of take in what was going on over there. And we just so happened to be at a, at a high end of the sunspot cycle. So we were getting some pretty good propagation out of the Middle East uh, during that time frame. Larry Van Horn, N5FPW, an expert on monitoring military communications, who spoke recently in a virtual presentation for the Fairlawn, New Jersey Amateur Radio Club. The 1922 book, The Radio Boy's First Wireless, by Alan Chapman, has a forward by Jack Binns, who was the Marconi wireless operator on the vessel the RMS Republic. The RMS Republic was rammed by the Italian liner SS Florida and sank on January 23, 1909. It was the first ship in history to issue a CQD distress signal. The U.S. Revenue Cutter Services Gresham and the White Star Liner Baltic responded to the distress call sent by Jack Binns and it saved many lives. You can download the 220-page book from www.fulltextarchive.com. And while it's of its time, 1922, so it's rather boy-orientated, I'm afraid, it's well worth listening to the foreword written by Jack Binns. He said, It is very appropriate at this moment, when radio has taken the country by storm and aroused an enthusiasm never before equalled, that the possibilities for boys in this art should be brought out in this interesting and readable manner, shown in this first book of a series. Radio is still a young science, and some of the most remarkable advances in it have been contributed by amateurs, that is, by boy experimenters. It is never too late to start in this fascinating game, and the reward for the successful experimenter is rich, both in honour and recompense. Just take the case of E. H. Armstrong, one of the most famous of all the amateurs in the USA. He started at home, experimenting with homemade apparatus, and he discovered the circuit that has revolutionized radio transmission and reception. His circuit has made it possible to broadcast music and speech, and it has brought him worldwide fame. He had no elaborate laboratory in which to experiment, but he persevered and won out. Like the radio boys in this story, he was confronted with all kinds of odds, but with true American spirit, he stuck to his task and triumphed. The attitude of the government towards the wireless amateur is well illustrated by the expressions of the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, and is summed up in his declaration, I am for the American boy. No other country in the world offers such opportunities to boy experimenters in the radio field. The government realises that there is always the possibility of other important discoveries being made by boy experimenters, and that is the reason it encourages the amateur. So don't be discouraged because Edison came before you. There is still plenty of opportunity for you to become a new Edison, and no science offers the possibilities in this respect, as does radio communication. And you can read more about Jack Binns at www.jackbins.org. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. 
Vili, Hotel Bravo 9 Alpha Mike Charlie, reports that Switzerland's National Amateur Radio Society, the USKA, showed its gratitude to the organization's volunteers by organizing a day out for them. On Saturday, November the 6th, 2021, the traditional annual meeting of USKA's Executive Board employees took place. Executive Board employees are members who make themselves available for the supervision of individual areas of responsibility and are willing to spend a few hours of their time each week on this. Examples of such tasks are the Society's QSL service, supporting their HAM Academy and HAM webinar, contest evaluations, editors, the intruder watch service called BandGuard, the electromagnetic compatibility core team, maintainers of the IT systems, and much more. Without the Volunteer Board of Management, the USKA could not function properly. So, in gratitude for these very valuable commitments, the USKA arranges an annual excursion, and this year the trip took the team to Solitern. In the morning, the 21 attendees caught up on recent developments and projects of their society and discussed them with the representatives of the USKA board. At the same time, a city tour through the extraordinarily well-preserved Solitern Baroque Old Town took place for people accompanying the members of the team. After lunch together in the historic restaurant Basseltor, everyone visited the well-known museum ENTER, E-N-T-E-R, which covers computer and consumer electronics. Expert guidance was arranged for the visit. There are always vacancies in the group of executive board employees. On the one hand, there are existing functions that need to be filled, and on the other, there are new tasks that are being added to the renewal process of the USKA strategy. Members who would like to actively contribute and engage for the benefit of the Swiss amateur radio system are welcome. Swiss hams interested in this are asked to get in touch without obligation, stating their significant areas of expertise. You can find out more at the USKA website, tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Switzerland. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. So what tools should I bring is a question I often find myself asking. Unlike changing the oil in the car, I can't always bring all the tools I want to when working on a tower. Lots of folks use a hanging tool bag. I don't use one, so I don't get to carry all my tools. I have to anticipate what I may need to bring along. The job sort of dictates what tools I'll need. I often wear a light windbreaker with two large zipper pockets on the front, and that's where most of my tools and supplies ride during the climb. The basics I usually carry on first-time installations are pliers, vice grips, wrenches in standard sizes, one locking razor blade knife, two small variable wrenches, one multi-purpose belt-mounted hand tool that includes screwdrivers, cutters, and a knife. I also bring several rolls of coax seal and electrical tape. Some extra stuff I always bring are a AA battery-powered HT and an earbud speaker. I bring two loop-type canvas climbing straps, extra carabiners, a camera with film and battery. I photograph my work for the customers. Many of them seem to really like that. When working on an installation I'm not very familiar with, I use extra straps and safety gear just in case. If the tower you're climbing on has a steel safety cable, but your ascender is made for ropes, the ascender will slip down or not lock with downward pressure. Always be sure to bring extra carabiners if for nothing more than to secure each ascender where you climb to so they don't slowly, silently sneak downwards. There are two basic types of applications for ascenders. For climbing with a steel safety cable, the regular rope type ascender won't latch properly. Climbing with a steel safety cable ascender on a rope, the rope could get damaged by the tough clamping action of the steel cable type ascender. Always be sure you are using the proper type of ascender before climbing. An ascender is a device which is slipped over a rope or cable and is connected to a climbing belt. As the climber goes higher, the ascender slides up the cable but if pulled downwards, it grips tightly and holds in place. Many commercial towers have safety cables. Before you use a safety cable, check it and be sure it's in good condition. When climbing down on the same ascender, you must grab its handle and lift upwards to release the catch and then push the ascender down as far as you can reach, then climb down to it. 
An additional safety device you could use would be a carabiner from your harness to the safety cable in case you unknowingly became unattached from the ascender. I hear from lots of people about a fear of climbing. I always tell them the same thing. After you get above the treetops, you lose the sense of gaining altitude. Just like riding in a commercial airliner, if the plane gained or lost altitude, maybe a couple thousand feet, you would have no way to tell just by looking at the ground. The same thing is true for tower climbing. The change in the way things look is so gradual, it's hard to tell you're getting higher from the air. I'm always too busy paying attention to what I'm doing and how I feel. I seldom pay attention to the scenery until I get to where I need to go. It's difficult to look straight down since the tower blocks most of your view. It's easy not to ever see the ground directly below you. I think a healthy respect for heights can help keep you from taking unnecessary chances with safety gear too. So don't let a little fear stop you from taking care of your own tower work. What you should be afraid of is climbing without the proper safety gear and training. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. In a recent Hackaday article, Stephen Walters, Golf 7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee, says that throughout history, people have devised ways to send information across long distances. For centuries, we relied on smoke signals, semaphore, and similar physical devices. Electricity changed everything. First, there was the telegraph, and then radio transformed communications. Now, researchers at the University of Lancaster have demonstrated another way to send wireless data, but without using electromagnetic radiation. They've harnessed fast neutrons from Californium-252 and modulated them with information with 100% success. The setup was interesting. The radioactive material was encased in a cubic meter steel tank filled with water. A pneumatic system moved the material to one edge of the tank, which allowed fast neutrons to escape. A scintillating detector then picks up the increased neutron activity. It seems like it's akin to using what hams call CW or Morse and college professors call OOK, on-off keying. Well, you can do that with just about anything you can detect. A flashlight, knocking on wood, or, it would appear, neutrons. What practical applications of this might there be? Well, the paper suggests that the technique could send data through metal containment structures, like those of a nuclear reactor, or perhaps a spacecraft where you don't want anything unnecessarily breaching the containment. After all, neutrons cut through things that would stop a conventional radio wave cold. It seems like you only have to prove that you can detect something to make this work. It really doesn't matter what it is you're detecting. It does, however, seem that it would be much harder to do more advanced types of modulation using neutrons. With tongue-in-cheek, Stephen says that maybe this is why we don't hear from aliens. They're all Morse code operators with neutron-based telegraphs. You can read Stephen's full article at hackaday.com. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77, at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, researchers are experimenting with one antenna that's so small it might just blend into the wallpaper. Imagine an antenna that doesn't look like an antenna. 
Scientists at Princeton University's Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education have done just that. They're basing their work on something called large area electronics, which allows electronic circuits to be created on material that is both thin and flexible. As a result, they're hoping to develop an antenna array that could be incorporated into something as thin as wallpaper or even a skin patch. Their findings are published in the October 7th issue of Nature Electronics. A report on the phys.org website quotes Naveen Verma, the senior author of the study, describing how the researchers adapted zinc oxide thin film transistor technology for wireless use. They created a phased array of antennas in a road that is 30 centimeters or one foot long. Lead study author Kan Wu of Stanford University said this phased array allows for point-to-point -point wireless communication. Although phased arrays are already employed by cellular networks, radar systems, and satellites, scientists are seeing this new development as showing promise for handling even more ranges of radio frequencies than ever before. Scientists said that to add to their usefulness, the antennas could be located practically anywhere, even as wallpaper in a room, making it potentially compatible with devices being driven as part of the Internet of Things. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week, by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization, and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our web for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.